This video talks about lateral pontine syndrome, or some people call it lateral inferior pontine syndrome. So in order to understand um, lateral inferior pontine syndrome, we should be understanding lateral medullary syndrome first. It makes a lot of things easier to understand. And the reason for that is because first there is a midbrain, then there is a pons, and then there, there is a medulla, right? So imagine this is the midbrain, this is the pons, and this is the medulla. The structure tends to run in the same direction, like so in the midbrain and pons. Some of them go here and then cross to the other side. They, those are those two. But in general, a lot of them tend to just go straight. Pretty much there is a pattern that follows. So that's why it's important to understand lateral medullary syndrome first before understanding lateral inferior pontine syndrome. So whenever we're talking about different cranial nerves, um, sorry, different brain lesions, we have to keep in mind the cranial nerves that are associated with it. For example, midbrain deals with three and four cranial nerves. Pons deals with five, six, seven, and eight. And when we're talking about the medulla, we're talking about nine, 10, 11, and 12, okay? So if you can see that there is cranial nerve 7 deficit, okay? Let's say cranial nerve 7 is deficit. Do we really have to think what syndrome it is? Really not, because we already know that it's a pontine syndrome. Now what can happen is there could be multiple sy sy syndromes, right? It could be pontine and medullary or pontine or midbrain. So that is a compound uh, problem. But what I'm trying to say is where the cranial nerve is, that gives us a clear indication of what kind of syndrome we are looking at uh, when we're t looking at it individually. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is the lateral medullary syndrome. So apart from the fact that the cranial nerve 9, 10, 11, and 12 is involved, there are three structures which are common in lateral medullary syndrome, which are spinal thalamic tract, okay? Spinal thalamic tract is responsible for pain and temperature. And don't forget that this is contralateral, okay, because it's going to cross the fibers onto the other side. Then there is a spinal trigeminal nucleus. The spinal trigeminal nucleus is also present in the lateral medulla, so that's going to be affected. This is ipsilateral, okay? I just want to keep, it, keep these sides clear so that you don't lose a sight that we do have to remember which, which one is on which side. And then last but not the least is the sympathetic tract, okay? That is also ipsilateral. All these three structures are present in the lateral medulla. Now, sometimes you can forget these structures, so another easy way of remembering are three S's, okay? Sympathetic tract, spinal trigeminal nucleus, and, and uh, spinal thalamic tract all starts with S's. So this is my lateral medullary syndrome. So do you think it's a stretch if I say that all these three structures is going to be present in the lateral pontine syndrome? Not really. These are going to be present in the lateral pontine syndrome. Okay, so if I say what structures are common between lateral medullary syndrome and lateral pontine syndrome, that's exactly these three structures. They're also going to be present in lateral pontine syndrome. Now, if that's true, then how do we differentiate between pons? and medulla? Well, it's quite simple. We go back to our basics. And what is our basics? We look at the cranial nerves involvement. If we have cranial nerve 5, 6, 7, and 8 involvement, we know it's pons. If we have cranial nerve 9, 10, 11, and 12 involvement, we know it's medulla. Now, we do have to keep in mind that when we're talking about pons or medulla, we're only talking about the lateral side, okay? So the lateral pontine syndrome is not going to have all the cranial nerve involvement. Only two of them are going to be involved. And those two cranial nerves are going to be 7 and 8. Then what about 5 and 6? 5 and 6 is commonly seen in medial inferior pontine syndrome, okay? And what about lateral medullary syndrome? For lateral medullary syndrome, the only one cranial nerve we are not going to see is 12. We're not going to see 12. But we are going to see deficit of 9, 10, and 11. Okay? 9, 10, and 11. So the next question that we can ask ourselves, are we going to see deficits of all three the cranial nerves? Probably not. It all depends on the extent of the injury. But if we see involvement of any of those three cranial nerves or 
then we can say safely say that's a lateral medullary syndrome, uh, considering the fact that these three structures are also there, or at least two of them or one of them are there. So it's all relative, right? We, we, we do have to say, okay, so this is there, that's there. Okay, so this must be lateral medullary syndrome. So they might not give you symptoms for all the cranial nerves, maybe one of them or two of them, but it's still a good indication that it's a lateral medulla. And the same thing for lateral pons. If they give us a facial nerve deficit, we know it's lateral pontine syndrome. Or if they give us a deficit of cranial nerve 8, then also we know that's going to be lateral pontine syndrome. Additionally, the sides, see how the spinothalamic was contralateral, the effect was contralateral. These are not going to change for lateral medullary syndrome or uh, lateral pontine syndrome. This is going to remain the same. Spinal thalamic has a contralateral effect. Spinal trigeminal nucleus has an ipsilateral effect. And sympathetic tract is also going to have an ipsilateral effect. Now, what about blood supply? What if you have um, a block in your artery that supplies a lateral pontine syndrome? Which, what kind of blood supply do we have in the lateral pons? And the artery uh, the name of the artery that supplies the lateral pons is going to be ICA. Okay? Anterior inferior cerebellar artery. So as a result, instead of calling them lateral pontine syndrome, many people call it ICA syndrome. Now I have drawn two pictures here onto the other page to give you an indication of what um, the medulla looks like and what the pons look like. So this is the picture of the medulla and this is the picture of pons, okay? So many times you can have questions where they're going to give you a cross section and they will be asking you to identify. So do try to familiarize yourself with what a lateral pons look like or a lateral medulla looks like or a caudal medulla looks like so you know which diagram to pick. So it's not only about the vignette but it's also about the cross-sections of the different brainstem lesions.